Um, I just want to make sure I imagine since this is a conference related to extensive reading, the vast majority of people here are familiar with Stephen Krashen's input hypothesis uh, and the necessity of comprehensible input. Uh, I'm going to assume that's uh, a given here. Uh, most people are familiar with uh, Day and Bamford's 10 principles of extensive reading, kind of, you know, the guideline for many of us, what exactly is extensive reading. I'll show you those in a moment. Uh, are familiar with M Reader, the system Tom Robbs created to help schools determine if students were actually reading and keep track of the books they were reading, and are familiar with X Reading, the system I developed, uh, which also helps schools determine if students are reading, but also more importantly gives access to the graded readers. Okay, so this is M Reader. Again, it's just a, a website of quizzes for I believe over seven thousand graded readers. Uh, NX Reading is a digital library. Uh, oh, two years ago, we had a thousand books. Now we're up to almost 1500. Uh, it's continually growing. Okay, but I'm not here to talk about X Reading. Uh, my point I'd like to get to is Tom and I uh, spent a tremendous amount of time and energy developing these two systems because we thought that these were the going to um, make extensive reading much, much easier for everybody to implement. And it was going to be, you know, this hugely successful, this, this would allow extensive reading to take off around the world, okay? Uh, however, we both noticed something, uh, which I, we called failed extensive reading programs, okay? Uh, I noticed it, Tom noticed it, and when we got together, we started discussing this phenomenon. And when I say failed ER program, I, I don't mean anybody got injured or anything like that. Um, just simply students were not reading as much as the teacher expected, okay? Or students were not enjoying uh, what the, you know, as much as the students, the teachers expected they would, okay? Um, and I think this goes, you know, for one, just teachers had too high expectations, like teachers often have, you know, you know the best uh, laid plans don't always work out as well as expected. Um, but when Tom and I really thought about it, we realized in some ways it goes back to the 10 principles, the, this, uh, this phenomenon of teachers being disappointed. And despite the 10 principles being you know, extremely helpful uh, and well-intentioned, uh, they don't explain actually how to implement an extensive reading program. In, in some cases, they actually impede the success of a program, especially in an academic setting. Okay, in other words, these are, are great ideas and they can be very helpful, but in some cases they can actually be uh, counterproductive. Okay, uh, so these, if you're not familiar, these are the 10 principles of extensive reading. Um, and Tom and I thought that if we were going to try to come up with 10 principles, uh, these, these are the principles if you want to implement an extensive reading program, we want to come up with. 10 principles of a successful ER program. Okay, not, this is for teachers, again, who already know Stephen Crash and input hypothesis. They understand graded readers. They understand the importance of comprehensible input, but just their program is not working out as well as they had hoped it would. Um, and we were gonna, in kind of paying homage to the 10 principles, we were gonna make it the 10 of extensive reading. We were gonna make it the 10 principles of a successful ER program. Uh, however, after, uh, coming up with about 30 principles, uh, we then started realizing that most of them or many of them were actually just factors of the same principle. So <laughs> we ended up with eight, uh, but I think that's still pretty good, okay? Uh, so number one is teachers have to set goals and track their students' reading progress, okay? I, I think too many teachers have the uh, impression that I'm just gonna introduce my students to extensive reading, it's so much fun, they're going to enjoy it, and that's it. And unfortunately, that's just not the reality, okay? Uh, they need short-term goals and long-term goals, okay? Uh, long-term goals are very important, but sometimes they can be too daunting. Read 100,000 words or 200,000 words over the course of the year. Uh, it, it's a lot on students on the first day when they see that. So there should be short-term goals for how much they should read every week, Oh, every two weeks, and then also the longer term goals. Uh, students, students need to know they're being monitored. Um, 
because otherwise, again, they're, they're just not going to do it. And I'll, I'll get to that in, in the next slide, the next point. Um, and it's important to regularly display their progress to let them know that you see what they're doing and that they should know, that it should, they should see what's going on and they should be aware. Okay, so the first point is, again, setting these goals. The second point is assessing and grading. Okay. Uh, I think especially in the early days, the idea was extensive reading is for students' personal satisfaction and therefore should not be graded. Um, but I would argue um, students are very busy. If it's not assessed, they're just not going to do it. Um, maybe, sorry, may, maybe the best analogy I can give or one I enjoy, like to give, uh, students consider Grades, or I should say grades, are currency for students. Okay, what I mean by that is that's how they get paid by getting good grades. Okay, and, and that might sound a little strange, but I often tell teachers, I mean, how many of you enjoy teaching? And I think almost everybody enjoys teaching. Of course, there's difficult days and uh, days we wish we were not teachers, but I think most of us enjoy being teachers. We're not doing it for the money. We're not doing it for the fame. Okay, we enjoy being teachers. But when I ask a group of teachers, how many of you would teach every day if you were not paid for doing it? Although most teachers enjoy their jobs, very few would continue to do it day after day without being paid, largely because they have other things they need to do. They need to support their families. Um, and payment, while it may not be the only criteria, only motivator, it's still an important one. And I would say it's the same for grades with students, okay? They're busy with other things to do, other homework, part-time jobs, social activities. If they're not getting some reward for the effort, they're just not gonna do it. Also, I would say assessment benefits both your unmotivated and your motivated students, okay? Uh, the reason for that is uh, unmotivated students, are probably not going to read. It's pretty evident they're not going to read if they're not graded on their reading. Okay. It's a motivated student, I think we forget about. Okay. A motivated student, if they see that their classmates are getting the same credit that they are getting and doing much less work, it's eventually going to take a toll on their motivation. Of course, some students, a very small percent, will just love reading and continue doing it. But many of those students who are good students and want to do all the work, when they start seeing that their lazy classmates are getting the same credit for doing nothing, it is going to hurt their motivation. Okay, but very importantly, the assessment needs to be fair and unburdened, unburdensome. So unburdensome means, for example, writing journals or summaries. Students generally find that quite burdensome. And writing in foreign languages is challenging and difficult sometimes. So I would say in general, if your focus is on getting students to read more, probably better to avoid things like uh, essays or writing requirements. And the alternative might be quizzes, but if the quizzes are tricky or difficult, again, it's not gonna help students' motivation. They need to be very fair and easy if the student has read, okay? Also, I suggest having easy to reach minimums and hard to reach maximums, okay? Uh, so a common rubric might be something like this. Okay, it has to be 59,000 words or 100,000 words, whatever it is, there's a pass and a fail, okay? I would say this is not a very good approach because as many of you can imagine, what is going to happen when a student reaches 60,000 words? The vast majority are going to stop right there. Okay. Doesn't matter if they're in the middle of a book. It doesn't matter if they're in the middle of a paragraph. When they know they've hit that passing score, many of them are going to stop. So, this is probably a better approach in that at least you're giving more, a higher grade for more reading. But I would say this can be improved upon by something like this. Now, it looks very similar, certain grades for a number of words read, but if you look carefully, the gap between the grades, 60 to 70% is 20,000 words, but 70 to 80% is 30,000 words, 80% to 90% is 40,000 words, and 90% to 100% is 50,000 words. 
Okay, and these are not exact numbers, the percentage, the points, the words. The point I'm getting at is that you should make the highest goal something that you know only a few of your top achieving students will be able to reach, something that they will feel very proud of doing because they knew they were the only ones who could do it. At the same time, make the minimum something that you know your lowest motivated or lowest ability students can still do and feel satisfied and pass the extensive reading portion of the grade of the class. Uh, how much should they read? That's a very uh, different answer for every institution. I've created a kind of rubric uh, based simply on reading speed and time. And I, I don't have too much time to show this to you, but I'd be very happy if anybody emails me. I, I'm very happy to share this. It's just a very simple uh, Excel spreadsheet with some formulas uh, put into it. So if you know your student's average reading speed, let's say in my case, my students, the average reading speed for one class is 125 words a minute. I want them to read for 10 minutes per day. So I can calculate, I want them to read approximately 8,750 words per week. There's 14 weeks in my semester. That's where I'm gonna get my minimum score. My students at minimum should be reading 10 minutes per day. And that's going to be right here. Oops, I'm not sure you can see this. And then if they read beyond that, then they can start getting more points, okay? Again, as I said before, these are, do not copy these numbers. These numbers have to be appropriate for your students. The idea though, again, is make it easy for those who don't wanna read so much and challenging for those who do, okay? Um, also just some guidelines, obviously, depending on the type of class, if you're teaching a four skills class, you're probably going to expect less reading. Uh, if it's an English majors class, if it's a reading class, if it's an extensive reading class, under each of those conditions, you're probably going to want your students to read more. Okay. Uh, next point is you should integrate extensive reading into the class as much as possible. If extensive reading is done totally separate, um, not related to what's being done in class, you're going to lose some students. Okay. I'm sorry. Students are not going to see the purpose. It's just something they're being graded on if you can integrate it somehow. So number one, the easiest thing is just give them some time in class to read. I'm not suggesting the entire class, but give them five or 10 minutes that tells them this is something important to do. Okay, uh, another idea is have the reading done for homework and in class, spend a short amount of time doing some kind of activity that is related to the reading they did the night before. Okay, I think that very often today is called a flipped class. I think when I started teaching, we just called that uh, being prepared for class. Either way, I think you get the idea that students uh, can be expected to do something with their reading during class time. Uh, also, the use of class readers can be very beneficial. I don't know if anybody saw Michael Fermanovsky's presentation earlier today when he talked about the class readers and his kind of adapted reading circles or literature circles. Uh, can be very engaging, giving students a purpose to read. Also, competitions between classes, between individuals, between pairs, this can be very motivating for students. Okay. Um, extensive reading should be part of the reading, uh, the whole curriculum, not just one teacher or one class. Okay. Uh, because students are not going to get enough benefit for that. Okay. Um, and the benefit of extensive reading are real, but they take time, okay? And you have to make sure students are aware of that and colleagues are aware of that. You're not going to see big benefits in just uh, a couple of weeks. Um, Jackie, can I ask how much time do I have left? I wasn't really excited, I started so quickly. Is it almost over? Uh, you have got until the 20 past. Which I think on my clock is about two minutes from now. But the next presenter doesn't start until 10 to 4, <laughs> so. Okay, well, I was going to say, though, maybe, yeah. maybe there, there are eight principles. Okay, yeah, yeah, please finish. <laughs> well, no, there's eight principles, and there's always a chance that someone else might show up, so right. I can leave the four. Right, right, right. If, if you'd like me to, I can, I can continue going through the, 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 the next pre principles. The next, next presenter is starting at, at 25 past. Oh, at 25 past. Oh, I do beg your pardon. Oh, okay. So if anybody is still listening and was interested in uh, these keys to a successful extensive reading program, um, 
I'm happy, you know, if I get a chance, I will share these later in the presentation or, or later in the conference, or I can always send the, the slideshow to anybody who's interested in seeing it. Right. Okay. Cheers. Cheers, Paul. Thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>